I'm Julie Smith, the director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund. And I'm Laura Rosenberger, director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. In recent years, we've both spent a considerable amount of time examining Chinese engagement across the European continent. We've looked at Chinese aims in Europe, we've looked at their tools that they use to achieve those aims, and we've also looked at Europe's response. We're gonna to bring together our top insights on these activities to provide an overview of China's toolkit in Europe to help European and American policymakers better understand and address China's malign behavior. Before we get to China's toolkit in Europe though, let's just take a minute to review what's happened over the last few years. So China's engagement with Europe writ large has increased significantly over the last decade plus. China is engaging much more not only with the EU and national capitals, policymakers across Europe, but also European citizens and private sector companies. The engagement on the Chinese side spans an array of actors as well. First and foremost, you have the Chinese Communist Party, but you also have Chinese private sector companies and state-owned enterprises. Because, though, the line between the public and the private sectors is so fuzzy in China, sometimes Europeans aren't exactly clear who they're actually engaging. If you take, for example, the organization called the China Society for Human Rights Studies, at first glance, this is an organization that looks like a regular non-government organization, an NGO. But in reality, this is an organization that is government organized and has strong ties to the CCP. In terms of people-to-people -people contacts, uh, Europe has seen a significant increase in engagement there as well, both with universities and think tanks. And on social media, we found that China is finding its voice. Many Chinese ambassadors across the European continent are now jumping on to social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. The biggest change, though, in terms of engagement on the European continent when it comes to China and Europe really revolves around Chinese investment. Investment. Between 2008 and 2018, more than 670 Chinese or Hong Kong based entities with significant ties to mainland China invested in Europe. That was 45% more China related activity across the European continent than what the United States did during the same period. Now, I would note that there's been a drop in Chinese investment since 2016, but that's mostly because of the tougher restrictions that China has placed on capital outflows and also tougher European screening measures. So what's driving these trends? Well, first, Europe is a key area in the Chinese party state's efforts to expand its influence globally, to reshape global rules and norms in the Chinese Communist Party's favor, to propel its own growth, and to create leverage for itself. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, works to undermine US and European competitiveness in order to advantage itself. To do that, the CCP is working to divide Europe from within and the US from Europe because it weakens its competitors. There's been a lot of talk of decoupling in the economic context and in the technological context in particular. But I think that that conversation often misses the point. It's framed as if this is something that the US or Europe is looking to drive. But in reality, the CCP is driving a lot of this strategy. Xi Jinping set a goal of Made in China 2025 as part of his um, technology and cybersecurity agenda for China. And a key chunk of that means making technology within China itself and not being dependent on supply chains or external innovation and technology for China. But to get there by 2025, it actually requires acquiring European technology and innovation in order to meet that goal. These technologies are also being used to support the PRC's military modernization. Finally, the U.S. has pulled back from Europe, which is creating new opportunities for the CCP to come in and deepen its influence and coercive leverage. 
So on the toolkit that China is using, we found that China uses a range of coercive, malign, and often asymmetric tools to gain leverage, to weaken its competitors, and assert its own influence. What Laura and I would like to do is just walk you through a few examples of the toolkit that China is relying on. And I'm going to tick through four of them before handing it back over to Laura. Let me start first and foremost with energy and economic coercion. All of the investments that China has made and is making in critical infrastructure, in emerging tech, and the energy sector has a couple of different purposes for China's interests. First and foremost, these investments create dependencies on China writ large and on Chinese supply chains. China then uses those dependencies to create opportunities to buy political influence. One of the more often cited examples of this is when a Chinese shipping company, Costco, went into Greece and purchased the port of Piraeus. Shortly thereafter, we saw a very interesting development, and that was Greece decided to block an EU statement at the UN Human Rights Council that was aimed at criticizing China's human rights practices. This is just one example where China China uses the investments that it makes to then push for political favors. China also uses these investments to set standards in new industries or even old existing industries where they've been operating for some time. And lastly, these investments give China the possibility of using these relationships in a future conflict to exert pressure and issue demands. So that's tool one. Tool two that I wanted to talk about was cyber espionage, hacking, and theft of research and intellectual property. Here, what China is trying to do is to obtain technologies that it lacks without having to innovate. China is also trying to gain a foothold in sectors that will ultimately undermine US and European competitiveness. The third tool that I wanted to mention really is tied to China's relationship with Russia. And this is a relationship that China uses to enhance its toolkit, particularly in some relatively new areas, such as disinformation and technological collaboration. We have a case where both of these countries strongly support and are advocating for cyber sovereignty. They're also creating a whole web of tightly monitored and controlled information. But this is a relationship that goes far beyond digital and tech issues. In fact, we've seen cooperation surge in other areas, in the defense area, in economic and energy issues, uh, and also in the political realm. Just to give you an example, in the defense arena, for example, we've seen since 2003, these two countries conduct over 25 joint exercises together. That is a strong way to signal to the world and neighboring countries that are close to where those exercises take place of the power and the influence that the two can exert together and serve as a very useful act of intimidation. The fourth tool that I wanted to mention today before turning it back over to Laura really ties to what China is trying to do at the subnational level in Europe. China does use its toolkit against Brussels and in individual national capitals in Europe, but it's really expanded its network with city mayors. And here, what we often see is the Chinese come in promoting something that they call safe cities. This is a concept concept where they claim that they're helping cities use smart technology to keep their citizens safe. But that concept can often involve tech exports, for example, facial recognition systems um, that allow these cities to then pursue means that China uses at home. And it has major ramifications for things like privacy, surveillance, and information norms. Other 
other forms of engagement at the subnational level include joint police patrols, something we've seen China developed with cities such as Milan, Rome, and Belgrade. So those are four examples of some of the tools that we're seeing China use on the European continent. But let me turn it back over to Laura to walk through some of the additional tools in the toolkit. Thanks, Julie. And I'm going to talk about three additional categories of tools. But as I do so, I would just like to note that there's a lot of intersection between these tools, between the ones that I'm going to lay out and that Julie's laid out. And it's one of the reasons that we think it's so important to actually see these tools in an integrated way, to see the big picture. So let's talk about these three additional categories of tools. The first is something that we're calling sharp power, or really that our colleagues at the National Endowment for Democracy coined as sharp power. Um, and I'll walk through a few examples of this. But sharp power is something that's not to be confused with soft power. Soft power is the power of attraction, it's culture, it's using um, you know, open information and exchanges um, in order to facilitate you know, understanding. But sharp power is something that Beijing in particular uses. That's actually, it's coercive, it's corrupting, it's malign, it's non-transparent. And so while these tools, while, while these pathways often use the similar um, avenues that soft power does, it actually looks very different when you look under the hood. So the first space along these lines I wanna talk about is the cultivation of friendly voices. Um, this is something that we particularly see in relationships between Chinese party state entities and think tanks or universities. Um, so in the first category, um, we see funding for think tanks and universities, sometimes in a non-transparent way, in order to cultivate um, pro-CCP views or pro-CCP research. For instance, the German press revealed that an agreement between the Free University of Berlin and the Beijing headquarters for the Confucius Institutes, which are institutes that are ostensibly aimed at promoting understanding of China, that agreement in that case subjected the German institution to Chinese law in exchange for over $500,000 to train up to 20 European Chinese language teachers a year. In Budapest, a think tank launched under the umbrella of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences has focused heavily on promoting the 17 plus one, which we'll talk about more in a moment, but is China's chosen avenue for engaging with, with the friendly voices in Europe as the best way to approach the region. The cultivation of friendly voices though goes into other spaces as well, including cultivating friendly political figures through economic and financial support. One prime case of this was in the Czech Republic where support from an entity called CEFC and a Chinese individual, Yan Jianming, um, they provided about a billion dollars in economic projects and hired former Czech politicians. Um, in exchange, Ya was named as a special economic advisor to President Zaman, who adopted pro-PRC stances at odds with much of Czech's history and previous policy positions. These include its claim over Taiwan, be supporting Beijing in its claim over Taiwan, and includes brushing back domestic concerns about PRC influence, including from Czech security officials. We also see the cultivation of friendly voices in the academic and journalist spaces through paid trips and trainings that influence how these individuals not only see issues with relation to China, but the norms and practices of media and academic inquiry. In some cases, this even includes journalist trainings. Um, when you think about it, of course, um, you know, the free media is not exactly something that Beijing is known for. In fact, um, it's one of the things they are most restrictive on. So the idea of journalist trainings in, in China feels a little bit um, oxymoronic. Another way in which sharp power manifests is through information manipulation. And Julie touched on this just a little bit earlier um, through some of the tactics that we're seeing on social media. But I think it's important to note that information manipulation is not just about narrative, but it's also about controlling and manipulating information architecture. So let me give a couple of examples on this. The, the first is that I think we've seen the broader course of tools that I just walked through come together with information manipulation very clearly recently in the so-called mask diplomacy around COVID-19 assistance. 
through great fanfare around its donations, PRC entities sought to promote themselves as a partner of First Resort and to criticize Brussels and Washington for ostensibly failing to show up. They also coerced official, European officials to praise China's handling of the virus and not to take aid from Taiwan, or if they had taken such aid, not to thank Taiwan. Josep Borrell, the high representative, characterized as well as the global battle of narratives. And the EU actually named China as one of the actors who had engaged in coordinated disinformation around the COVID crisis. But this also extends to things like promoting Chinese platforms like TikTok and WeChat. You know, with TikTok, we've seen pressure recently um, to prove its independence from the government, and that may actually be pushing it to become more transparent. But we know that last year, The Guardian um, obtained rules, um, content moderation rules from TikTok that included requirements to censor um, topics that the CCP deems to be offensive about, for instance, Tiananmen Square, the Falun Gong, um, and other related issues. We've also seen Chinese investments in traditional media. So for instance, the Chinese state-owned broadcaster CGTN actually now has the most liked Facebook page of any French language news outlet. And in Germany in 2020, the um, German public broadcaster ARD faced criticism for building a documentary solely from propaganda images provided from China's, um, from one of China's entities, um, forcing the, the German broadcaster to take that down. And as Julie mentioned, you know, we also see this extending into things, you know, that relate to shaping governance around cyberspace and information, really trying to reshape norms and rules to create a more closed information space. And then building architecture for information that is supportive of a more closed system. So a lot of conversation has um, gone on in Europe about 5G and Huawei, but that's just one piece of the information infrastructure of the future where there's a battle happening. And some of it's happening in these standards bodies that Julie mentioned, where for instance, Huawei is also advancing a new internet protocol that would create a different way of, of routing data and delivering data on the internet that would enable much more intrusive um, inspection by government entities. The last piece that we see in terms of the toolkit is, is strategies to divide allies and partners. And again, I think we've, we've touched on this in pieces, but just to quickly walk through a couple ways this manifests. I mentioned the 17 plus one already, this regional forum that China has constructed with the, indi with the individual countries that it believes will be most favorable to relations with it choosing to go through that forum and mechanism rather than working with the EU. We see um, narratives being driven to um, undermine Brussels and Washington, to cast doubt on them as partners, and to prop up Beijing. We saw this again around the COVID-19 assistance, including the use of covert social media campaigns um, that were aimed to, to discredit um, the EU for supposed inaction. And then the Belt and Road Initiative is another pathway for PRC infrastructure investments on its terms, bringing closer, closer political ties and leverage for Beijing. A number of European countries have joined, including Italy, which was the first G7 country to do so. And BRI, again, undercuts European unity on things like investments in strategic sectors. So I'm going to hand it back to Julie now for a conversation of, of what we've seen from Europe so far in response. So Europe's been taking a number of steps to address some of the challenges that we've just outlined. Both the European Union and individual EU member states are doing a much better job of monitoring what's happening inside their own borders. They're much more clear-eyed as well about what China is actually striving to do. And they've created new policies and launched new initiatives aimed at protecting both European companies and European citizens. Citizens. Just to cite a couple of examples, last year in March, um, what we saw was that the EU created a new investment screening measure, which is designed to foster greater transparency, promote best practices, harmonize national screening policies across Europe, and protect especially sensitive industries such as critical infrastructure, emerging tech, and dual-use items such as semiconductors. And just this past summer, 
summer in June, we saw the European Commission announce some new proposals to deal with the issue of foreign subsidies. Now what happens in Europe is that foreign investors must disclose whether or not they receive state support in order to prevent those entities from using state subsidies to outbid competitors in Europe. And in the wake of the global pandemic around the coronavirus, we've also seen the EU unveil a whole new recovery fund, which will provide much needed financing to EU member states so that they can rebuild their economies and protect themselves from selling sensitive companies to China. But progress across the European continent has been uneven. Um, we've seen some countries take on this challenge in a more robust way than others. There does seem to be a bit of a divide between the North and South uh, in Europe. And some of the measures that have been created actually lack enforcement measures. The end result is that China is not fundamentally altering its behavior and in some cases is doubling down. So what more should be done? I think there's a few things that should guide us. The first is seeing China's big picture strategy not just looking at each tool or tactic in silos, but understanding the ways that China is exercising power and how that's undermining Europe's interests and democratic values. We need to build new means of cooperation between NATO and the EU, within governments, between governments, and between governments, the private sector, and civil society. We need to enhance cooperation across democracies, including with the US and with Asian allies from which we can learn a lot of lessons. We need to focus on resilience within ourselves. As NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg has emphasized, this is a problem of China coming to Europe's shores. That also means we need to build up European expertise on China. Really understanding the country is really critical to how uh, understanding how it's exercising power and influence. We need to put democratic principles at the center of our response, fortifying democracy at home and ensuring that the ways that we respond don't play into Beijing's hands. We need to invest in and better leverage European and alliance innovation and reduce dependencies that provide coercive leverage. So those are just a few more things we need to do. So a lot of work that remains to be done, especially in a transatlantic context. And Julie and I hope to continue to work with policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic as we work to achieve these goals. We think this matters because democracy and our way of life are at stake. Thanks for listening.